Welcome everyone. My name is Sri Krishnamurti from Quant University. And in this month's webinar, we are pleased to invite Patrick Hall from bnh.ai and also a faculty member at uh, George Washington University. And uh, it's exciting times for Patrick. Uh, he has <laughs> just finished writing a book, uh, which means that he has a lot of free time on his hands now. Uh, we were just talking about it, about travel plans and all the things he could potentially do. Uh, but we'll talk more in the next 45 minutes to 50 minutes or so on what uh, managing artificial intelligence risk is all about and how do we do it in the context of high critical and uh, applications which require you to assess risk, not just deploy and then see what happens, but also think about assessing risk. Um, as you all know, Quant University has hosted these webinars in the last five years or so, and we have invited eminent uh, uh, academics, uh, people who are working on things from a practitioner perspective, but also people who are researching this area. And the area of artificial intelligence is rapidly growing. And uh, as most of you know, uh, the chat GPT craze has uh, uh, not stopped in the last three to four months. And everybody who wanted to kind of you know just kind of be the fly on the wall thinking about what ai is now diving deep into it we are seeing enterprises take on artificial intelligence projects on a on a large scale basis and we are seeing a lot of adoption of uh, new tools which also brings up the question what is our responsibility as engineers as uh, people who are in the profession to look at these aspects and think about like what do we need to do and what are the frameworks and guardrails that need to be put in place before we deploy these applications in the real world. As most of you know, the risks associated with AI are novel, but also something which we have not even considered in the last 50 to 60 years as we have built up automation systems, as we have built up a lot of algorithmic systems. But uh, the amount of uh, compute the amount of uh, access which these uh, processes and these uh, methodologies have provided means that we are going to see tectonic changes in the workforce, tectonic changes in the way uh, automation is done and how companies are going to be adopting these technologies. So uh, Patrick's work is very much contextual and it brings the perspective of how do we responsibly build systems and of these processes on a regular basis as we are deploying these applications. As a quick introduction, uh, my name is Sri Krishnamurthy. Um, I am the founder of Quant University, and uh, this is the 10th year of Quant University. So we have been uh, operating in the last 10 years, working primarily on the intersection of data science, machine learning, and finance. And we have uh, uh, basically used education as a means of enabling companies and uh, helping them with threading the whole path of how do we go from understanding these concepts to deploying them in a large scale basis. Uh, we work with uh, uh, regulators, large enterprises, hedge funds, um, asset management companies. And we also are building out a whole curriculum primarily focused on enabling practitioners adopt uh, data science, machine learning. And uh, in the recent past, we have focused on artificial intelligence risk. We are also looking at how does generative AI, large language models, and various other innovations which are happening in the space, and how do we typically build and deploy these applications responsibly. And uh, uh, Patrick Hall is the co-founder and partner at uh, bnh.ai. So Patrick requires no introduction in the risk world. So he has uh, worked with large companies, Fortune 500 companies, but also um, has helped out in framing the whole discussion uh, working with NIST and the uh, NIST AI risk management framework has got a lot of uh, inputs from uh, BNH.AI and uh, Patrick Hall. And he has also uh, done his tour of duties at SAS, at H2O.AI uh, and various other firms and uh, also serves as faculty member in the George Washington School of Business, wherein he teaches data ethics, business analytics, and machine learning classes. Um, when, when you kind of you know, hear of all the things Patrick has done, you will probably think about like, oh, Patrick, he must be like 60 to 70 year old, um, but uh, he just celebrated his 25th birthday. <laughs> um, so uh, happy birthday, Patrick, and welcome to the program. 
I just feel 60 or 70. That's all. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually in my forties. I'm actually in my forties. <laughs> Um, maybe, I don't know how you keep your hair. I'm, I'm in my 40s too, but I lost all of it, uh, kind of pulling it out, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, responsible AI will definitely make you pull some hair. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I just, you know, I, I have some slides that we'll go through, but Patree, I want you to keep me honest. And it's it's great to be here with you and, and have more discussions. Um, but just two things I'll, I'll key off of, you know, just just hopefully to keep things interesting based on your opening remarks um, is, you know, why? Well, yes, I did. I did finish the book. I think it's a good book. Um, the, the book is about um, really implementation details for whatever we want to call it. Responsible AI, trustworthy AI. Um, how, how, do, how do we go from frameworks like SR117 or the NIST AI RMF to Python code? And not, not that, you know, I, I just, you know, Python is, is the common language these days in machine learning. Um, so, so, you know, no, no particularly special preference to Python, but just how do we go from, from these frameworks, SR117, uh, to, to code? How do we go from NIST AI risk management to code? And, and I hope the book helps with that. Um, you know, some other interesting things that, that, that I thought you brought up is it, you know, these are heady times in AI. Um, and there are also heady times in, in AI risk. Uh, you know, I've, I've been quite busy and was saying before we started recording, I have, I have a, a quite busy June. Um, and I, I sit on the board of something called the AI incident database. And, um, I, you know, the, the incident database has roughly doubled, doubled in size since, uh, since the end of last year when chat GPT came out and, uh, you know, we, we see incidents, everything from, you know, just kind of amusing minor incidents to, to people being talked into suicide, really sad, tragic stuff like that uh, with, with these AI systems. So um, big time in AI, big time in AI risk. And, you know, another reason I hope the book is helpful and just in general, the, the work that you and I do is, is helpful, Shri, is because... You know, I know, I think a lot of people dialed in today, you know, a lot of your network come from the finance space where there are some regulations in some cases. Um, but for people who are working outside of that and outside of regulatory frameworks, it, it, it puts a lot of pressure and burden on the individual practitioners to quote unquote, do the right thing or do the ethical thing or the responsible trustworthy, whatever word, you know, whatever buzzword we want to sub in there, you know, without strong regulations, there's a lot of um, sort of burden on on the person whose hands are on the keyboard, and um, and I you know I I'm no fan of of sloppy lazy data science and there's plenty of that out there but I think it's also important to acknowledge that that without sort of regulations um, a ton of responsibility falls on the people whose whose hands are on the keyboard and you know if if you're like me you're you are you were trained as a technician you know you you didn't receive training in ethics and you didn't receive training in in compliance and and regulation and and it can be a tough spot to be in and i think you know i think quant university helps with that problem i hope the book helps with that problem i hope bnh helps with that problem but um you know, aside from the commercials of it, it's it's just a tough spot to be in for data scientists who who you know want to do the right thing, uh, and and so you know I I'll, I'll let you chime in and as, as I kind of get back to the beginning of this deck, but uh, you know before before I do, the the book is available for free right now. A PDF of the book is available for free right now from Data IQ. Um, so go grab it, go grab it while it's free. And uh, feel free to buy a copy off Amazon or Barnes and Noble or, or uh, from O'Reilly. So um, I'll go ahead and move back to the beginning of the slide tree. But if anything I said kind of kind of triggered a response on your part, please go for it. Absolutely. Uh, so you're basically saying that the book is available to everybody and uh, people need not wait till then to answer your questions to get like specialized PDF versions. Yeah, yeah, there, there's a free PDF version that, that Data IQ has made available. Um, and I think you have the link on the Zoom, but, but sure. or no, yeah. I think you have the Amazon link on the Zoom. Uh, but, but whatever, I can find it when we get into Yeah, the, so you can put it in part. the chat window. We can, yeah. we, can display, we can kind of, you know, make sure everybody gets a copy of it. Yeah. Um, all right. So, you know, this, this whole field of 
you know, I, again, there, there's an issue of what do we even call it, right? And I think that the vocabulary issues are, are a, a problem in, in data science and in, in sort of the broader field of data science or AI or machine learning, whatever we want to call that. And then we get into this, this discipline of ethical AI or trustworthy AI or responsible AI, you know, so whatever we want to call that, that sort of sub-discipline. And I've really come to appreciate framing it in terms of risk management. And so, you know, I, I like that NIST did that. I like that U.S. bank regulators have done that for, for over a decade now. Um, and so, you know, my, my personal journey through ethical AI and responsible AI and trustworthy AI has sort of landed it at risk management. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. I think it's just, you know, it, it's the most realistic framing for large organizations today. Right. It, it's really hard for a large sort of profit driven organization to, to understand and act on what it means to be ethical about technology or understand and act on what it means to be responsible about technology. Um, I think I think it, it's just easier for organizations and the people in large sort of commercial organizations to think about risk management. There, there's commercial framing there that, that I think resonates more clearly. Um, not that ethics aren't important, but I'm, I'm not an ethicist. Um, okay, so, so just on that sort of topic of um, AI risk management, I'm, I'm sure, you know, I know you've had people from, from the, you know, directly from NIST on before, and I'm sure you've had, you know, people from the, the you know, banking risk management side. But um, I'll draw attention to this. It, another thing that you haven't seen that's available for free, if you haven't seen it yet, is the, the NIST AI RMF, the NIST AI Risk Management Framework. And um, the, the book is, is, is um, sort of meant to be in alignment with, with the NIST AI Risk Management Framework. And I'll go ahead and say, you know, if you like ISO better, if you like IEEE better, fine, that's fine. I just worked on NIST. It's the one I understand the best. Um, there are other good standards out there, actually. So I think it's cool that, that you know, things are evolving to the point where we have different sets of standards to choose from. And, uh, you know, ISO and IEEE are, are the uh, other standards that I'm, I'm most familiar with. But I'm going to talk about this because it's the one I know the most about. Um, and again, you know, link down on the screen, down at the bottom of the screen there. Go grab this if you haven't yet. Freely available PDF. Um, so, you know, and... Earlier this year, January 2023, NIST released the you know first non-draft version after putting forward a concept paper and two drafts. Um, NIST released the AI risk management framework version 1.0, and um, you know it, these definitions on the screen are fine, but I think you know I think the thing I'll key off on here is is the definition for risk. Um, so we you know there's a standard definition of risk that applies to um, cars, it applies to machine learning classifiers, it even applies to, to large language models and, and other generative AI systems. And that's, that's just this basic notion that something can occur, a good thing or a bad thing can occur, and uh, what's the probability uh, if, if it occurs, or what's the probability that it occurs multiplied by the, the sort of cost or reward if it occurs. And this has been really careful to, to point out that AI systems oftentimes have both positive and negative, um, you know, risk and opportunities associated with them. And, you know, it, so I, I want to be clear, you know, and, and careful to say that, that, you know, I, I don't think, obviously, I don't think everything going on with AI is negative. I, th I think there's a lot of great possibilities out there. Um, and, and I think, you know, thinking carefully about risk means just thinking carefully about threats and opportunities. Okay, so um, I'll, spare, I'll spare everyone the, the life cycle. I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen many, many life cycle slides in your lives. Um, this does put one out there that I think is a better one. And, and just quickly, I'll call out that they put people and planet in the middle. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of cause to start thinking about the, the sort of environmental and ecological risk associated with AI and machine learning. And, um, you know, NIST answered those calls, at least to a certain degree, and, and did some framing around the, the potential environmental risk. So this was the first AI lifecycle that I that I'd seen that took into consideration 
um, ecological and environmental risk. So, um, you know, but but I'll move on because I'm pretty sure everybody here has seen an AI lifecycle diagram many times. But Shree, feel free to stop me if, if you have any questions or comments here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, um, you know, trying to define this notion of, of trustworthy AI, which would be sort of risk, the risk aware practice of AI, um, you know, how do we do risk management at, at that high level, not at that code implementation level. Um, NIST put for, you know, seven sort of sets of characteristics um, that, that any given kind of trustworthy AI system should attempt to attain. Um, and there's always trade-offs between these systems. Uh, I'm sorry, there's always trade-offs between these, um, these characteristics, but I do also think it's a possible, it is possible to achieve them all uh, when we really need to. So, you know, NIST says that for a system to sort of attain trustworthiness, it should be safe, um, it should be secure, it should be explainable and interpretable. And, you know, it, it, explainable basically means in, in this parlance, um, sort of technical low level explanatory information is available and interpretable would mean that 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 information gets, you know, in, into a, a user interface or some other kind of interface where it's actually meaningful to people that people can contextualize it in their own human experiences. So explainable, more low level, interpretable, uh, slightly more high level and enables people to contextualize technical information. Um, you know, we should be we should be concerned about data privacy for these trustworthy systems, um, both with the inputs and the outputs and any other sort of artifacts along the way. And um, you know, we want systems to have their their biases managed. In particular, you know, th these systems do um, learn and uh, sort of perpetuate regrettable systemic biases like racism and sexism, but there's also um, human biases, you know, for all, all the economists that might be listening, right? There's a, there's a lot of the, the sort of concepts that you might've heard of in, in you know, thinking fast and slow, um, anchoring and, um, and, you know, sort of just different human biases. We have all these biases that, that help our brains function and get us through the day. But if we're not careful, they, you know, they, they cause us to make wrong decisions. And those wrong decisions can have pretty serious out, you know, in, impacts on when we're designing AI systems. So we got to think about systemic bias. We got to think about human cognitive biases. And um, we got to think about just, just the kind of bias that we learned in statistics class. Um, and, and we want to manage all of those types of bias. Um, then we have these sort of two framing sets of characteristics, accountable and transparent. So that sort of gets up to the highest possible level of, of what we mean by trans transparency. You know, is, is how the system works actually, you know, is it, is it meaningfully communicated to people? Um, and is there any accountability associated with that transparency? Hey, you told me this is how the system works, but I can see that's not how it works. So now what happens? You know, does somebody get in trouble? Does someone get um, their money back? Does someone, um, you know, have some kind of recourse method? And so we want these systems and the people around them to be accountable. Um, and we want the systems to be transparent in sort of a meaningful way, you know, whether that's documentation and instructions or, um, pictures and people talking to us about how they work, whatever it is, we want the systems to be sort of transparent in a way that's meaningful. And then the, on the bottom, you see valid and reliable. And, um, you know, our, our friend Agus Sugianto, whenever I see him talk, you know, says we should really be, you know, people have these kind of fantasies of machine learning models being like these self-learning entities that, that, update themselves and just learn to make more and more perfect decisions. Um, and as far as I've ever seen, that's really kind of a fantasy. Um, and and <laughs> there's been some great AI incidents from people trying uh, adaptive learning and online learning. But, uh, you know, Agu says to think of models more like you're building a car, right? When we build a model, we need to build something that's going to work in a variety of different conditions for a you know, fairly long amount of time. 
And so that's what we mean by reliable. Is, is the system going to work as expected over time? And valid is one of my favorite ones. Va validity gets to these notions um, that, that I think kind of gain prominence in psychometrics back, uh, you know, in, in the, the heydays of, of um, standardized testing and psychometric testing, uh, which is often now, you know, being supplanted by machine learning. Um, you know, psychologists develop these notions around validity, like, like what does it mean for, for a system to be scientifically valid? And, and just to be directly honest and brutally honest, right, a lot of the models that I trained earlier in my career, a lot of the models that I encounter now just don't make any sense. Uh, they, they, they lack validity. You know, if you're, if you're training a fully connected neural network on structured data, I'd really want to know the justification for your, you know, sort of thousand degree interactions and things like that. When, when you know, really at, at, at most, a lot of um, sort of objective studies have shown that, that you need two way interactions to, to have good performance. So, you know, I'm, I'm just using that as, as a common example. And, and I think, you know, I, I don't want to come across as judgmental. You know, I've, I've learned all these lessons the hard way. I've done all the bad things myself. Um, and so, yeah, like just for example, when we're training a, uh, you know, fully connected neural network on, on structured data, what's the point of all that nonlinearity and all those interactions? Is, is there any valid scientific reason for those? And I think oftentimes not. And I think what that leads to is just, you know, among other things, poor real world performance, a lot of overfitting um, and a lot of under specification. You need a lot of data for all those parameters. Um, so, you know, this is this is one way to frame sort of how to think about trustworthiness. And then I have to call out down at the bottom. And this this is just a, a point that I got from from social scientists at NIST. Um, you know, computers don't trust you. You can you can try to tell me that, that you know, these large language models or generative AI systems are alive or sentient or, or, or whatever, but I'm not going to go for it. Um, computers don't trust. We don't know how to make them trust. Um, trust is, is sort of a, a concept that's aligned with, with people and animals and, and it, you know, some, some kind of different in intelligence than what computers have. And so really only humans can trust and only humans can make systems trustworthy. And I think that, you know, that's, that's a cold hard fact and, and not, not one that, that goes along with a lot of today's AI hype. But, but certainly one that I don't think any of this hype has changed. Certainly not a point that, that for me, any of this hype has changed. Um, the other way NIST frames sort of risk management in AI and, and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna talk about this slide and I'm gonna transition to sort of topics in the book and, and how I think, you know, you might already even be implementing these, these controls and, and uh, you know, like, what, what the book says about them and how you might already be doing them. I'm just kind of trying to give some, some framing here. So, you know, we talked about these seven ways to discuss trustworthy characteristics for, for systems that are used in high risk applications. And, you know, an another way NIST frames how to do this for high risk systems is what functions, you know, so what, what things do we do when we're trying to manage risk? And, and this says that we govern so we set up boring written policies and procedures. We set up these sort of organizational charts or organizational structures that, that allow for people to do their jobs, their risk management jobs better. Um, you know, we do a lot of documentation. And then I think something that, that both Sri and I have, have come to appreciate is, uh, is, you know, risk management needs to be incentivized. Risk management is typically kind of boring, tedious work. I enjoy it, but but certainly not everybody does. And so if people are going to do it, they need to be incentivized. And I think, you know, thinking about how to set up salaries and pay and promotion is, is a big part of, of model governance and AI governance. And then, you know, the, the sort of call out with governance gets back to the point about trustworthiness and, and humans. Um, you know, my opinion, my you know, strong opinion is is people are still in charge. People are still smarter than computers, um, and and since that's the case, that means that governance is about people, and and not that I'm not for technology governance or data governance, but if you really want to have an impact and really manage risk, you have to govern the people around the system, and not just try to do everything with technology controls, uh, and and just to put it as as bluntly as I can. 
um, a computer doesn't care if it gets fired, right? If a computer is the computer that's used to train a bad model and you go unplug the computer, it doesn't care. It doesn't know. Okay. It, it doesn't have any accountability. Only people have accountability. Um, so, you know, we get our governance structure set up. Then we want to map risk. Um, map just means sort of understand and then document. And I think that the big thing that, that I really want people to think about um, is that, sure, we can talk about like the risk of, of low performance in test data. Um, I'm not against considering that. And I think that, that model validation and, and sort of basic in silica traditional model assessment is, is an important step in the model life cycle. But really what we care about is, is how the system functions in the real world. And that's what I mean by in vivo, within the living. Um, so we want to acknowledge risk in the in vivo context. We want to acknowledge risk in, in the deployment context. Um, and, and that's very different than the risk of me sitting in my office typing on a computer. And I think that, again, that, that can be really hard for, for data scientists because it's not what we're trained to do. It's certainly not, you know, I feel like me and some others are, are some of the first people to teach classes that maybe help people think differently. But for decades, you know, it was just about test error. Uh, we got to break out of that if we really want to manage AI risk and think about how our systems function in the real world. Um, we need to measure risk in our system. So this is things like bias testing, um, model validation, looking at, at you know, uh, population stability index, looking at conformal models and things like this. Uh, you know, how, how do we start measuring some of our, our risk in, in deployment? And I think a thing that we have to be honest about, with ourselves about, um, and that again kind of undercuts a lot of the, today's AI hype is we don't really know how to measure a lot of these risks yet. So, so sort of the measurement of AI risk is really in a nascent stages. We we know how to do some bias testing. Uh, we know how to do some testing for robustness and and security, um, but but it really pales in comparison to the complexity of of the real world risk. Um, and then manage, you know, we, we actually, once, once we've put governance structures in place, we've understood our risk and documented them and measured them to figure out how bad they are, then we want to do something about it. And that's, that's the manage function. And I think the key there is prioritization, right? Nobody, not the U.S. government, not J.P. Morgan, not Facebook or Meta, uh, nobody has enough resources to, to manage all of their risk, um, you know, fully. And so you just have to prioritize. And so we want to think about the largest risk when I when I do probability times, um, you know, cost or impact. What's the biggest number? What's the biggest factor there? And those are the systems I want to concentrate on first. And, you know, sometimes we do things like to mitigate risk, like, um, you know, monitoring models and, and augmenting them with business rules. Uh, sometimes we transfer risk, right? Sometimes we transfer our risk onto other people through insurance or warranties or contracts. Um, and sometimes we just accept risk. And um, there's a lot of risk acceptance in AI today. And it's, and it's worked out financially, you know, and, and sort of technologically for a lot of people, risk acceptance. So, um, you know, not, not to downplay just, just taking on the risk. Um, but again, right, we, we don't want to stay too focused on what we're doing in our laptops or in our development environments, we want to think about what's happening in the real world with our system. So um, in silica um, means on your computer, in vivo means in the real world. And we really want to think about real world in vivo context and risk management in those contexts versus, um, you know, getting every little I and T dotted in our, in our Python code. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, call out, you know, some, some interesting work behind this, behind the RMF and then, then get into the book a little bit. Um, so just quickly, one of the best papers I've ever read on explainability and interpretability. And I know Shree that, that you talked to Professor Brony Atowski, who's a GW yeah, so David was a presenter yeah. and also his presentation and slides associated with this work is also on Pew Academy. If anybody's interested to go and watch that lecture. I, I think it's just one of the best things I've ever seen written about explainability and interpretability. And, you know, there are a lot of smart people that, that put out definitions of what they thought explainability and interpretability should mean. Um, David and NIST were the first people I ever saw tie it to actual, you know, known theories of cognition, 
how our brains process information. So um, I think that's, you know, that's really important because that's basically what it's about. So it's a, it's a great paper about how to kind of ground concepts of explainability and interpretability and sort of known theories of human cognition. The bias, the bias work is, is great. I think it, it definitely applies to generative AI. I think there's this kind of wild notion that like everything that was written before. Um, and again, Riva was also a presenter at the Q lecture series. So she has her lecture associated with this work is also available on Q Academy. As a all right, and then, <laughs> then we got to get Danny. We got to get Danny in to go over the glossary. Absolutely, so, so, absolutely. Let's, so let's, let's get him in. <laughs> so there's these horrible vocabulary problems, right? And so one thing that we had to do in the NIST AI framework is write a 500 plus word glossary of all these things. So uh, NIST has a big Google sheet out there. It doesn't say what's the best definition or what is the right definition, but it tries to present multiple definitions for sort of 500 core um, responsible AI uh, terms from, from, you know, the most authoritative standards uh, we could find. And, and, you know, I want to give lots of credit to Danny there for, for leading this effort. He did a great job. Um, there's lots more to, to come with the RMF. You know, it's a, it's a decades long um, endeavor, we all hope. Uh, and so, so stay attention, pay attention to that. And yeah, so I just want to get into like what the, getting into a little bit of, of the book and then making sure to save time for some questions. So you know, you may already be doing some of this stuff. I was already doing some of it. Um, a lot of it just makes sense. And and so I just kind of want to throw out things where if you're doing them, you're in you're you're already sort of thinking about risk management. And if you're not, maybe get you to think about doing them. So um especially for structured data, we we know how to make machine learning models very um very high, have very high quality performance and um, retain extremely high degrees of explainability. So again, you know, if you're, if you're training a, a, a black box on explainable, you know, fully connected neural network or traditional GBM on, on structured data for supervised tasks. I love autoencoders for unsupervised tasks, by the way. Um, you know, I, I think, I don't, I don't think that's the right thing to do anymore. I think that there's just this whole ecosystem of explainable models somewhere here on the screen, EBM, explainable boosting machine, GAMs going back 10 or 20 years, linear models going back 200 years, um, GAMINET, neural additive models. You know, there, there's just this whole ecosystem of explainable models now for structured data that have just been shown to perform just as well or, or um, you know, the, the performance trade-off for an unexplainable model is negligible and, and the gains that you get from explainability are high. When we combine that with post-hoc explanation techniques, like you see here on the screen, partial dependence and ice, um, you know, this plot gives us a, the, the red dotted line gives us an estimated average sort of display of how the model's behaving for one variable. And then these, the um, other lines that you see are sort of the behavior for, for single individuals. And, you know, when we pair these kinds of post hoc explanation techniques, of which there's also an entire ecosystem, um, with explainable models, we can build these really transparent systems uh, that perform extremely well. And, and I will go out on a limb and say that I think that, that, you know, black box machine learning is basically obsolete for structured data at this point. Um, getting back to that point of validity, um, what you'll find if if you train some kind of crazy overly complex unnecessarily complex model is when you try to explain it it's just going to look like a bunch of nonsense and and that should really um you know give you pause and and have you think like well you know is is this even valid if you can't explain it what what is it um and i know i know there's people out there that that use sort of unexplainable systems in in pretty risk aware ways and do a ton of testing and monitoring and i know sometimes you just have to do it so i don't want to be too harsh on this point either but but i do think moving forward um you know the, the kind of black box traditional machine learning for for structured data is is, is getting obsolete um so this is again from our friend Goose's pymel package um not necessarily from the book, but the book talks about a lot of these things. Uh, so if you're doing like kind of stringent model validation, you're, you know, you're, you're already doing some of this stuff. And I, I know a lot of people, especially that work in finance are because you don't want to lose a ton of money. And, uh, and I think that the financial context is, is one of those places where there's a lot of motivation not to lose money. There's a lot of um, sort of 
institutional knowledge on how to build good models and and validate them um and and just to be blunt like that's that's fairly lacking outside of outside of finance um and and so i think in finance you have this interesting context where you can know that you're wrong because you're going to start losing money and uh and i think outside of finance people deploy models and have no idea if they're right or wrong all the time uh and so and i'm sure Shri can regale us with within finance horror stories but but you know i'll 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 just say that that this package put out by by the wells fargo model risk team just has the best model validation i've ever seen for again sort of talking about structured data um estimators and classifiers really pushing the limits towards you know what how can we understand how robust this model is to sort of um uh sort of large scale data shifts, how how reliable is it, sort of what's the envelope of expected predictions, just just really good stuff. So free, another free thing to go check out if you haven't checked it out already. And if you're already doing some of this stuff, then then you're really getting into the valid and reliable part of, of NIST definition of trustworthy AI and congratulations to you. Um, I just wanna add there. Yeah, that, yeah, please, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Agus, who you mentioned, um, and Agent Zhang, who wrote the SPIML package, so they actually presented a workshop uh, earlier this year, uh, which basically detailed how to use this package. So that's available on Q Academy too. And uh, you know, Patrick, I, and uh, Agus, and uh, a couple of others are collaborating, and we are building out a module which will basically showcase how to take some case studies and then think about articulating the risks associated with a particular model and the various facets on how you could potentially assess the risk uh, with that. And we're gonna be building out a bunch of different modules and we'll be releasing that later in the year. Uh, keep an eye for that. And uh, it's a part of the Premier AI Risk Management uh, Program, which we offer in partnership with Premier. It's going to be a pra practical module which people can actually try out and learn how to accomplish these things using uh, using the spam package so i just wanted to let people know yeah. that. <laughs> and and a goose has has twisted my arm into several other pymel trainings this summer so uh if, if you're interested in learning about pymel just just be on the watch out there's there's a couple trainings going on this summer i i can't say enough good things about it um it's a really excellent vision that 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 the pymel team was able to execute on so kudos to them and and yeah, I, Shri, me, uh, others of us will, will be doing more presentations about it throughout the summer and probably for years to come. Um, so, you know, something that's not in PyML actually that I've been harassing them about getting in there uh, is, is uh, you know, something more akin to kind of like security testing. And, and I think there's a lot that we can learn from our friends and colleagues in, in cybersecurity. Um, one being an adversarial mindset Right and and bringing an adversarial mindset into testing, these these systems when deployed in high risk settings can hurt people. But I think what we fail to think about oftentimes is people want to game our systems. People want to abuse our systems. And what are we doing, you know, to to prevent that from happening? And and so I think we have to think about the the sort of harm that we can do, but we also have to think about the harm that others can do with our system or the harm others can do to our system. And so I, I think borrowing that adversarial mindset from cyber is, is really important. And there's, you know, there's, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of all these different adversarial machine learning techniques. You've probably seen the example on the slide, but it freaks me out every time. Um, I, you know, one, I'm not a trained radiologist. I shouldn't even be looking at these slides, you know, whatever. There's a million things to say about the slide. I'm going to try to, you know, I want to transition to, to sort of audience questions soon, but I'm just going to go off on the slide a little bit, um, you know, we're living through this language model um, hype right now. It, they do incredible things. Certainly, I, I'm not trying to downplay downplay them that much. But but I did have to live through the computer vision hype, and I did have to live through everyone saying there would be no more radiologists. And uh, you know that's just patently wrong. That was just hype. Um, so so you know I shouldn't even be looking at these pictures because I'm not a domain expert. I don't know what they are. But here's what I do know. I cannot tell any difference between the picture on the left and the picture on the right. And that sort of, um, you know, invisible static that's created by the, you know, just the most basic fast gradient sign method to, to create adversaries, you know, adversarial examples for computer vision, um, you know, changes this, this image in a way that I can't even see. And, you know, we can just, just 
just switch the classifier, right? And so I just don't understand how a system that, that's so easily manipulated and that we can't see whether it's being manipulated or not, like how, how is that suitable for, for high risk settings? Uh, but, but what do I know? What do I know? Moving on, um, bias testing, there's all kinds of ways to do bias testing. Um, if, if your system is operating on people, you should probably try to do some bias testing. It can be challenging to get the data. Um, it's definitely something you want to work with attorneys and, and you know, sort of legal colleagues with, um, but, but definitely something you should do. And also something you should keep in mind that it's really just one part of bias management. And, and you know, just one of the findings from all this research with NIST is like, yes, do bias testing, but also just talk to, communicate to your users and ask them and understand if they are perceiving, you know, an experience of bias with your system. That's actually a much more effective way to do this than, than bias testing in your development environment. But nonetheless, bias testing in your development um, environment is important. There's an entire chapter of the book, chapter 10, that does just that. Check it out. Um, Again, talking about things that we can borrow from cyber, um, you know, and just really quickly, why do I talk about this borrowing from cyber? Well, we have model risk management, especially in finance, but it kind of assumes this state environment where uh, econometricians and statisticians with PhDs are, are fitting these carefully calibrated instruments and they're going to be rigorously val validated. Um, we all know that's not what happens out there in, in data science world. We're talking about basically amateurs using AutoML. And uh, in, in that more uh, less staid context of, of sort of regular commercial data science, you just have to expect incidents, right? There's no way that we're not going to get incidents. And so um, we have incident reporting and response that we can borrow from our, our cyber friends. And as I mentioned, I'm part of this AI incident database. Um, go check that out if you haven't seen it. Contribute to it. Um, we're always looking for more incidents and, and volunteer editors and those kinds of things. And then um, these bug bounties, and I've, I've had the, the honor to be involved with two of these bug bounties where we incentivize people to, to sort of try to test machine learning systems and tell us what they find. Um, the, the initial Twitter one on the Twitter image cropper was extremely educational for me, um, found all kinds of bugs that, that we couldn't find, um, or, or that, not that I couldn't find, but, but the Twitter wasn't aware of. Um, because they engaged their global user base and found out that their image cropper didn't like people with religious headdresses, things like this. Um, now there's this new red teaming exercise at, at DEF CON, which I'm, you know, I'm sort of on the outskirts of um, for, for these kind of high profile generative AI systems. And I'm interested to see how that goes. So lots we can borrow from our cyber friends. Um, and finally, you know, I'll, I'll just make some comments that to kick off the discussion. Um, so I want to be clear, like I use ChatGPT Pro. I actually don't find it that useful, but I find Grammarly really useful. I, I use Grammarly a ton. Um, you know, I, I think I think ChatGPT is great for writing Valentine's cards, writing poems for my kid, writing, you know, just, just it, it's actually great for those kinds of things. And, and it's fun. Um, it's these high risk use cases where it's going to be particularly challenging. And, and so as, as a lot of you know, you know, if you work at a big bank, it's probably banned on your networks because there are these pretty serious accuracy. I, I don't even want to say the word hallucination. It's just an error. Um, there are these pretty serious accuracy, intellectual property, data privacy and, and automation compliance risk. And then when you get away from chat GPT, I think OpenAI you know, who am I to say, but I think OpenAI did a much better job than people that came before them with, with sort of systemic bias issues and, and you know, chat GPT just saying horrible things. It's, it's pretty hard to get it to say horrible things. Um, but other chatbots still say pretty horrible things. You know, it's, it's really just chat GPT where they figured out the, the bias management. Um, so outside of bias, there's these pretty serious accuracy, intellectual property, data privacy, and automation compliance, automation complacency risk. If you're really going to try to use this in a high risk setting, I think it's difficult. I think you can't copy and paste um, from the user interface. You can't paste in because you're putting your proprietary information in. You can't copy out because you might be getting somebody else's proprietary information. You got to check all the content. You got to just read everything it says, which I think really cuts into the value proposition because it can be wrong a lot. And then there's this issue of, of you know, these language models aren't made for decision making. They're made to generate content, generate content. That's a different structure of the model. So unless you think that making decisions by predicting the next word is a good way to make decisions, I don't think it's a good way to make decisions. Then we have to be really careful about using these systems 
you know, accidentally allowing them to make decisions for us, like when they're drafting an email for us or something like that. So you really got to be careful with automation complacency too. So, you know, I, I don't, whatever, there are many smarter, richer people than me in this space. So what are, what are my opinions worth? But, but this is my opinion. I think these things are tough to use right now and in, in, in high stakes, high risk applications. So I'm going to shut up. Hopefully that, that saved a little bit of time for audience questions and, uh, and, and interested to hear what people have to say. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, and I know this is this is a hard field. Um, and I'll just kind of you know, relay an example, which I learned very really early in my career. Nothing to do with finance, nothing to do with artificial intelligence. Um, I was trained as a mechanical engineer. When I was trained as a mechanical engineer, we did a lot of testing for mechanical parts. And one of my favorite was what was called as NDT, which is non-destructive testing wherein you do a bunch of different tests on various parts so that you can see what would make this particular part fail, especially if it's going to be used in high critical situations. You know, it's the lever which controls the brake of a car or, you know, it's uh, the, the thing which goes on a big crane, which uh, is going to be carrying tons of loads from buildings. So all these things, when you talked about NDT, I think we were studying a, a whole series of different tests. And these tests were all about, oh, if you do this test, you got to look out for this. Oh, you got to be stretching this particular part and see when it fails. Oh, if you're going to be compressing this, it's going to fail in this particular way. If you're going to be coupling this with this other part and then twisting it, the torque is going to make it fail this way. So the questions we had was like, why are we learning all these tests? So that is the key part, which I think is going to be the focus of discussion in the next few years. Because yeah, yeah, I think, I, I think you're right. Time, you're right. You know, we've put in a ton of time to like, you know, basically articulate like all the things which we should be looking at in terms of facets. But now I think it's going to now be. Now we got to look at them. Where, you know, for credit risk case, what are the things which are relevant for fraud? What is going to be relevant for healthcare situation? What's going to be relevant? So I think. You know, you and I will always be looking at these specific things because, you know, our clients will be looking at, oh, how do we address this particular problem and how do we build this umbrella, right? So I think the learning needs to happen on both fronts. One is you got to know what's out there because unless you know what's out there, you're going to be taking the same tool to every particular problem, right? So you got to know what's out there, but then you also need to be able to apply it in a setting in, in the context of, well, how do assess risk? Because these are all the possible risks associated with this product problem, right? So, what would like to like hear? I don't know whatever you can reveal in terms of the pragmatic problems which you have been working on, and um, what are the issues you see? First of all, in the framing of the problem. Secondly, you talked about incentivization. So, what's the incentive for an organization to you know not just get like a report from you and say, okay, we got someone to watch for it, and we'll move on. Uh, to actually thinking, oh, these are things which we should be looking at. But then finally, where is where is what do you call the interest level? Is it mostly coming from the regulators, policymakers, the people who are kind of you know influencing these decisions, or is it still homegrown? Like, well, we got to be responsible when we deploy and build these products. So take it away. <clears throat> yeah. All great questions. So one, all right. So here's what I heard from your comment street, and I think that you know this is something I'm working on myself. We got to stop thinking of our models as I, you know, I don't I don't know like magical bits of Python code or something. Like they're consumer products. You know that that we really have to start thinking of of models as consumer products, right? If, if we're, it, it seemed all, all indications is, is that's where we're heading, right? We're making these machine learning systems, whether they're generative or not, um, to, to be placed in kind of consumer facing products or services. So we got to think of them as, as products. And I just want to think about like, if you were getting on a plane and someone started telling you like detailed information about the lift or the shape of the wings or the rotors or the, you know, the, the you'd be like, why are you telling me this? Right. And you're like, I don't care. I just want to know if I'm going to get there safe. And now you're telling me this and you're freaking me out. And I'm thinking I'm not going to get there safe. And so, you know, that, that's going to be really challenging for data scientists. It's incumbent on educators to help deal with this, but we, but we just got to reframe our thinking about risk from like test error, which isn't 
near meaningless in some cases um, to how is this thing gonna work in the real world and how are we gonna make sure it's reliable and, and does what it says it does in the real world. Mm -hmm. and, and so to that, to that point, I've actually seen some companies do this. And so we were working with a large company over the past few months um, on a model audit and it was like a meta model audit. It was cool. It was really cool. They, they had this system um, for understanding if their models and their analytical programs uh, have, a, have a, you know, statistically significant effect in the real world. And I really think that's a good way to think about it. I actually closed out the book that way. And it was before I had the, you know, the experience of working with this company. But they use some of these procedures. There's a couple of them. Um, Cynthia Rudin has one. Um, she calls it flame fast, almost matching. Exactly. There's an older one called course and exact matching where we try to pick out um, control and treatment cohorts from observational data. And then you go and test the, instead of testing the hypothesis of does my neural network overfit this data, which yes, it does. Um, you know, we go and test the hypothesis of, are we seeing the effect that we thought we would see in the real world, you know, in, the, in this control versus treatment group? Are we seeing the effect or, or what effect are we seeing? You know, because maybe we're not seeing that effect, but what effect are we seeing? So I think, you know, again, th there are starting to be these, you know, they have roots and causal inference, but they come from all over the place. These techniques for actually understanding how our system is performing in the real world. I mean, mo model monitoring goes back even you know farther than those techniques I was talking about. And then, you know, getting to your, your uh, question on an interest level, um, there's usually, and, and I think, you know, you, you probably know this, there's usually some stimuli that, that makes people call and spend money on risk management these days. You know, again, in finance, in a couple other places, um, medical devices actually, you know, software is a medical device, but, but you know, there, there's a few spots where the use of machine learning is pretty well regulated in the US. And, you know, so, so those people always call, but, uh, you know, outside of that, there's some kind of stimuli, right? And, and mm -hmm. interestingly enough, um, it's been whistleblowers. It, it's been sort of internal whistleblowing. It's been, um, it's been um, customer complaints. But, but yeah, people, people rarely just call and, and want to spend money on, on risk management. There's usually some stimulus for it, right? And I think that gets back to one of my opening comments, which I do want to iterate, you know, because I think I can come across as being kind of hard on data scientists, but I'm a data scientist myself. I try to be hard on myself. Um, and, and it's really unfair to, to put all this burden of risk management on the data scientists. But until there's regulation, that's just, it, it's just how it is, because nobody else is going to volunteer to take the mm -hmm. risk, you know, to, 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 to take the accountability and the responsibility. So um, we're just in this rough position where like data scientists end up making a lot of important decisions that they probably don't even want to make. And then, you know, we get customer complaints or we get an internal whistleblower or something like that. Yeah. Uh, another question which I typically get, and sometimes I struggle to answer, but I also kind of, you know, need to, uh, no pun intended, but use the chat GPT chain of thought and then let's think it through paradigms, if you will. That way you can get to the right answer or the answer you want to get people to understand and appreciate. And that's basically, how do you differentiate? Because now that a lot of AI focus has been happening over the last few months, you're seeing like every company wants to position their product as, oh, this is AI friendly, or this is focused on looking at this, there's a monitoring tool. Oh, okay, so there is an AI monitoring tool. Oh, there is an MLOps process. Oh, there is an AI focused MLOps process. So uh, a lot of people are thinking, oh, testing should be, and I think there was a question uh, Lawrence was saying, you know, isn't this just a model and shouldn't we just be testing it? Like what yes, we do in terms I, of- I said yes. <laughs> um, so uh, how, how do we differentiate this notion of uh, and again, I, I have mixed feelings because, you know, in terms of deterministic use cases, we have robust frameworks for testing. But when it comes down to like reasoning engines, wherein the, there's the stochastic aspect of the output, how do you typically frame these questions in the context of a production application? Because you don't want the software to be like, oh, we had never thought about that, but good job software. You thought about it. We didn't think about it. Um, I would be scared and shocked if 
I see something which the product is doing, which was not tested or which is, which is kind of something which is in the open. And we are like now thinking about adding band-aids and uh, justifying the answers post hoc, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think the, the last part you said was really crucial. Um, everything, everything in sort of risk management and AI ML is, is post hoc, right? It's all like the, the brilliant data scientists and engineers made this perfect, um, you know, model, but, but, but now we're starting to, to find some issues with it. And now, you know, two years after it's been deployed, can you come in and do something about it? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that that's a fundamental issue, right? If you want to get things right, you just have to start getting it right from the beginning. And, um, and that's more expensive and time consuming. Uh, and, and so one, I want to, so, so I saw some interesting questions. I think, you know, I try to follow what's going on in causal, causal inference. I'm more of a fan of, of what's going on in causal discovery. I'm sort of interested in these causal shortcuts, like, like, you know, finding, um, you know, half decent match cohort cohorts and observational data. I think all that's really important addressing one of the questions. And then, you know, the question that kind of keyed you off, isn't this just software? Should we just be doing software testing? Yes and yes, this is just software. ChatGPT is just software. Like, sorry, OpenAI, sorry, sorry, you know, big fancy data scientist, it's just software. And um, and I think one reason it works so well and, and got so much traction is because it is well tested. Uh, and and so, you know, but but I think you, you know, Sri and a lot of us on the call know that, that for whatever reason, just market pressure, laziness, or because there's so much work dumped on the data scientists, um, these systems don't get just basic software QA, right? And and so to, an, to a certain extent, I, I think a lot of this, this risk management stuff is a solved problem. Do software QA, um, do traditional model uh, assessment, do, uh, do model risk management, apply NIST, apply IEEE, apply ISO, whatever it is. If you do that stuff, you're gonna get 80% of the way there. And then you know each bespoke sort of application is gonna have some, some specifics and some specific risk. But, but yeah, I think it's a cultural thing. It's, it's a resources thing. You know, it, 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 SR 11 and seven is out there and tells you what to do. People know how to test software. Um, you know, it, it, it's just, it's a cultural question. It's a research, it's a resources question. Like why does this stuff not happen? Um, because there's a lot of market pressure for it not to happen, but I think there's other, you know, there, there's other reasons it doesn't happen too. So, so yeah, there, in many ways, this is just kind of boring and, and just, just doing what we know we're supposed to do. Um, but again, I want to highlight, right. Um, the, the thing where chat GPT asked the New York times reporter to marry him or whatever. Like, I, I think that was a big surprise to people, right? Like it, there's going to be specific risks. They're going to take you off guard for any particular system that, that you need to pay attention to. So it's like, you got to do the basics and then you got to scratch your head and think about the hard stuff. And really, as you pointed out, you got to start doing it from the beginning of the project. Cause when you try to come in and fix it post hoc, you know, you're just putting a bandaid on and, and then you got to put band-aids on the band-aids and band-aids on the band-aids on the band-aids. And you, you know how all this stuff goes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we are at one o'clock. Um, uh, thanks for all the questions and uh, this amazing discussion. So I would kind of, you know, end this with one loaded question. Take mm -hmm. as much time as you want. We can make the discuss for the next hour if you have the time mm -hmm. and if you are interested. So uh, many times when I have these discussions with my clients, they ask me pointed questions like, okay, so tell me why I should be doing all these things. Is there a regulation which expects me to do this? If not, then why am I spending all this money and why am I putting all this resources to actually build all these things? So um, the, the nature of many of these things are, there's a budget number I wanna reach only if I can get these things either certified by you guys or tested by you guys. So it's always a debate on how much is good enough. Should we wait for regulation to lead us the way or should we be building these frameworks and deploying on our own, hoping that regulation will catch up, but also being cognizant that these are necessary and you know responsible things to do as you're building out things. 
So what is your take on it? What should people be doing? Uh, I mean, like you and I probably share similar philosophies, but if there is a company out there amongst the people who are listening, what would you advise them on how should they be thinking about this in the context of wait versus be responsible and do things now? Yeah, it's a really good question and 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 a difficult question. Um, so if you're not working in a regulated space, it's tough. Um, but here's what I would say is, is that all over the world, um, generally speaking, companies are not allowed to sell dangerous products. They're not, they're not allowed to lie about what their products do. Um, you know, they're, they're typically not allowed to be predatory. And in the U.S., that sort of general product business process um, type of, of regulation and enforcement falls with the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. And, and so the Federal Trade Commission has been extremely vocal um, on, on issues around what they call UDAP, unfair, deceptive, and predatory practices. And, and it basically just gets, comes down to you, you can't make bad products, right? Again, you, you got to think about your AI system as a product. You can't make bad products. If you're on the highest tier of, of flagrantly offending bad products, then um, the FTC may may come for you and they have something that they call algorithmic disgorgement, um, which is a special penalty that they made for machine learning systems where, you know, and, and if there's lawyers tuning in, I'm sorry, because I'm screwing all this up, but, but basically, um, you know, they tell you that you have to shut down your system, they erase your data and your algorithm, and they put a bunch of legal paperwork in place to make it so you can't make money off that line of business anymore. And so, so even in quote unquote unregulated spaces, you know, if you're really being flagrant, you still have to watch out. And, and so, you know, I'd start with sort of basic product liability. If, if you want to get started now, start with sort of just, just your, your most fundamental yes. basics. Don't, don't make unfair, deceptive, or predatory products. And then I think the notion of incidents is super important, right? I think it's really hard to get people to agree on what, on, on these really ethics driven topics, like, like systemic bias and privacy, you know, you and I, the audience members, especially people in other countries and other cultures could, could have valid and very different ideas about what it means for a system to, to have its bias managed or to be private. And so, and, and those kinds of discussions can really bog things down within organizations. And so I think that's why incidents are so important, right? Like you might not be able to agree with your coworkers on what privacy means and, and what, you know, standards of privacy to apply and to what level but you can probably agree with your coworkers that you don't want to have an incident, right? You don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to lose money. You don't want the potential regulatory and, and sort of media attention. And so I think, you know, the, the way I tell people to get started, if you're not in a regulated industry and you don't want to wait, think about your basic, basic product liability obligations and think about preventing incidents. And, um, and I think that, that you'll have, you'll have much more traction there inside your organization than if you try to have a bunch of high minded discussions about privacy and bias, unfortunately. So, so that's, that's kind of my advice on that topic. And, and I do, you know, I want to keep reiterating it's without regulation, without, you know, the government saying someone else has to be responsible here, the responsibility falls on the people whose hands are on the keyboards. And that's not, and again, like, I don't think that's fair. We, we need to start training data scientists like medical doctors and civil engineers if, if we're going to keep going this direction. And we may need to do that. Um, and, and, but, but right now we're doing none of that, you know, and, and that's why we see so many incidents and, and, uh, you know, but, but I, of course, the, the sort of excitement and attention around the incidents pales in comparison to the, the hype and attention to the systems themselves. So I, I don't know, maybe things aren't that bad, but, but I think that we're getting to a place with a combination of sort of social media, surveillance technology, language models, generative AI, deep fakes. We're getting to a place where this stuff is going to really start to impact people in, in, in negative ways in their day-to-day -day life if we're, if we're not more careful moving forward. Maybe we're not there yet. I mean, I see it all the time. You see it all the time. It's our job. But I think if we, if we don't start taking these notions around responsible, trustworthy AI, whatever it is, more seriously, you know, we're getting into this place where you know, viral social media algorithms, deep fakes, um, generated content, it, it's really going to start making our lives worse, just, just in general. And so I, I hope we will be more careful about it moving forward. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, thanks so much for your insights, Patrick. And uh, please, uh, everybody, 
take a look at Patrick's book. Uh, it's available for free, um, but free doesn't mean that, you know, you can just kind of keep it on the side. You have to actually read it and make yeah. sure that and these concepts. Um, and you also want to make sure that um, um, you get to know what's out there because this whole field, as you can imagine, is constantly changing and you can't wait till you get to a point where you could say, oh, okay, I'm going to start looking at these concepts now. Uh, you have to kind of integrate various aspects of risk management as a part of your product building process. And in order to do that, you need to know what are the various facets of risk and how do you assess those risks and then also be able to stratify your whole process and your development methodology and make sure that you are providing the right resources to the right points. And I think uh, the work Patrick is doing and all the other folks like uh, Agus and uh, Riva and NIST and other organizations are doing, I think it's it's a fascinating field in terms of making sure that we understand these risks early on so that we can build those guardrails uh, before it can cause catastrophic uh, aspects and we'll have to start fixing those one at a time. So hopefully we'll continue this discussion and uh, make sure that we are going to responsibly adopt these products. Um, ultimately, my vision is when I buy an IAI product, it should be as simple and it should be as much of thought I put in when I buy a toaster. I would not be thinking about what testing it has gone through. I would not be thinking about whether if I plug it, will it blow up? Will I get electrocuted? Will it really do the job it's supposed to do? We need to be able to get to a point wherein we can adopt and buy AI products without having to think too much. And it's the responsibility of us developers, us regulators, us uh, software engineers, us uh, ethicists, us risk managers, to make sure that we build out those products before we release it into the wild um, and um, make sure that we are taking our job seriously and responsibly, like the whole industry does uh, in other, other fields other than AI. With that, I will um, uh, conclude today's session. Thank you so much again, Patrick, for taking off your uh, time and sharing your insights. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. And also we will be sharing the slides and also the video uh, if you have registered to this webinar and it'll be available on www.q.academy. So till uh, we meet again, bye-bye. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Shree. Thanks everybody.